Hello and welcome. Well, the past few days have seen a strain in the diplomatic relations between Nigeria and the United Kingdom. It all began with a decision by the UK government to place Nigeria and some African countries on its travel red list. A move, it says, was to reduce the importation of the new Omicron variant of COVID-19. But what followed was a chain of strong reactions from the Nigerian government, the United Nations, the WHO, and other prominent voices, calling it travel apartheid, knee-jerk reaction, discriminatory, and not science-based. So. Why did the UK red list Nigeria when at the time of the ban Nigeria had only recorded three cases of the variant? Will it be fair to reciprocate the ban? And what is the fate of those making plans to travel for family, education and other reasons? And how are both countries resolving the ampas? Well, I had a sit down with the British High Commissioner to Nigeria, Katrina Ling, where I asked her these questions and more to join us. So thank you for speaking with us, High Commissioner Katrina Ling. It's good to have you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Ah, thank you. So placing Nigeria on the red list, really, for a lot of people was a red flag. And for them, it was some sort of confirmation of the bias and discrimination they always thought was targeted at them. And they look at that list, they see only African countries. And then they look at the figures and see that most of the countries that are seeing a rise in the you know, Omicron cases are European countries. And they wonder, why not put the European countries on the red mm -hmm. list as mm -hmm. well? And I wonder for you, do you share those concerns as well? Well, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's a good opportunity to uh, address the people of Nigeria. And I first want to start by saying I completely understand the frustration and the anger. Um, I recognize that particularly at this time of year, with Christmas, which is a very important time for, for many Nigerians, um, this particularly disrupts travel plans, um, people's long-awaited trips to see, see loved ones and so on. So that reaction is, for me, completely understandable, and I recognize it, and I feel it myself. My own travel plans have been disrupted. I was due to be flying back next week for a pre-Christmas uh, get together with my family um, because I'm covering here in Nigeria for Christmas, but that's all been put on hold now. So it is, it has actual direct impact on individuals. So that's why it is, the reaction is very, is very emotional, very understandable. So I want to just on, put that on record that I understand it. But in terms of why Nigeria was added to our red list, um, I want to really stress the importance we attach to an objective evidence-based health system. And the way this is done is that um, countries are reviewed by our health team. So our health security agency, who actually work very closely with your NCDC, um, and particularly what they look at, and in the case of Nigeria, these two factors were what made the decision to add Nigeria to the red list. So the first is, as of the 4th of December, um, when the decision was taken, there were 21 cases of Omicron um, arising from travellers coming from Nigeria to the UK. 19 of those were direct travel links. So in other words, people who got on a direct flight, obviously either from Abuja or Lagos, and two were, Nigeria was part of their travel itinerary. That was the second highest after South Africa. So that's the first factor. The second factor is because we have such strong relationship, the volume of travel from Nigeria to the UK is very high, much higher than many, many other African countries or Middle East countries. It's a, it's, you're one of our biggest markets. And for BA, this is one of their most profitable routes. That's because the volume of traffic is, is extremely high. So that was the health assessment that determined why Nigeria specifically was added to the red list. There are other factors taken into account, but in terms of this decision, those were the two most relevant factors. So I, I, just, I wonder now, listening to people say that this is some sort of discrimination and um, they look at that the figures for mm -hmm. the European countries as well, which, I mean, you see that cases are increasing yeah. in Europe as well, and I wonder, when will that be done to European countries such that they look at that red list and they don't just see African countries? So, no, I completely understand that. And you're right that we are reaching a point where we've moved from cases being imported to what we call community transmission. So, in other words, people who haven't travelled at all are now starting to contract Omicron. And that is happening in the UK and it's happening in many European countries. But that's almost like stage two. Mm. 
So stage one for us, and the reason we did it was at that point, we felt we could take preventative measures, um, very quick preventative measures to protect the border to try and prevent us getting to that point of community transmission. And secondly, and crucially, because this is a new variant and our health security agency has described it as a variant of significant concern, as indeed WHO has, and very high risk, we needed to buy some time to, to assess three things. Number one is how transmissible is this, is this new variant? And evidence from South Africa suggests it is much more transmissible than either Alpha or Delta. Secondly, how, um, how viable are the vaccines? Will they still protect us in the way they have against Delta and uh, Alpha? And then thirdly, how, how, what's the impact of this, this variant? How ill will people get as a result of contracting it? So those are the three issues we're now working intensively on, in, including with Nigerian scientists, South African scientists. So it's essentially to buy a piece of time. So I'm not disputing that Omicron is now in European countries, in many countries, um, because we're at the stage now of community transmission. But we need this period of time, and particularly because Nigeria is such a huge market, volume of travellers, to, to try and um, prevent imports of new cases whilst we do this assessment. So earlier on, you referenced the WHO, mm -hmm. which is an organ of the UN. So we've had the UN, uh, um, the head of the UN speak about this. Mm -hmm. You had the WHO as well. You've had the Nigerian government speak about this, the National Assembly, the Nigeria Governors Forum, the Nigerian Association of Resi um, Nigerian Students, I should say. And uh, I mean, the, 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 the common thread is that they are all against it, vehemently against it, I should say. In fact, the, uh, the UN Secretary General used the term travel apartheid. So there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of that that you're receiving right now, the UK government as well. I, how are you internalizing all of that? Well, I've, you know, because of that strength of reaction, I wanted to reassure myself that you know, the evidence on which this is based was, was valid and, 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 and you know, evidence-based and based on the health assessment. So as I said at the beginning, I completely understand and acknowledge the frustration, the anger, because it has a very, very direct impact on many, many Nigerians' lives because of the links between our two countries. The impact in Nigeria is significantly more than it would be in, in many other countries, particularly at this time of year with travel plans for Christmas and also for students, and we'll come on, I'm sure, to students. Um, so I did, I have looked at this closely, I'm not a scientist, but I wanted to be confident before doing this interview that I felt I could understand and, and explain it. So as well as explaining, as I did before, about the Nigeria being the second highest number of cases coming from Nigeria and because of the volume of traffic, um, on the point about is this discriminatory, which is, you know, it's a fair challenge, um, I, can, I, I think I can say confidently it's not. When uh, the UK was the epicentre of the alpha variant, we took some very tough measures ourselves to essentially cut ourselves off and, and, and we banned all but essential travel from the UK. So now that was a very, very tough decision for us. Niger UK has been red listed itself, you know, in earlier stages of this variant. I think when Delta took off, we were red listed by, for example, Austria and by um, uh, France and I think Turkey. So we've been red listed ourselves by other countries. Um, and uh, we haven't just red listed in the past uh, African countries. So uh, Pakistan was red listed, Turkey was red listed by, by the UK when we had our previous red list. So I hope that gives you some reassurance that it is based on an individual deep dive and assessment of an individual country. It is based on evidence. We were under no illusions of how significant this decision would be and that there will be cost to this decision, both to individuals the economy and to potentially the, 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 hand, the handling of the relationship. So it is not taken lightly. It has, you know, we, we look at all of that, and, but ultimately there's only one thing that matters in making a decision like this. This is, this is about people's health and, and preventative measures to ensure that we have the time to assess the impact of this new variant, which we're all learning about. So d does that mean you're taking all of these you know, reactions? Are you taking all of them on board? No, I'm listening very carefully to these reactions. I'm reporting these reactions back to my government. Um, Nigerian voices are loud, they're very clear, they're very articulate, mm -hmm. and they're very uniform. Of course we're noticing that reaction. You know, we're under no illusions, and we were, I'm not surprised by these reactions, because I understand how very personally people feel of them. And I do understand that sense of grievance and frustration, but that's why I really want to reassure people that the 
only basis for this decision, this difficult decision, which does have impact, is, is, is a health assessment. It is done by our health professionals who would then advise our ministers. There can be no decision taken arbitrarily. These are scientists, mm. you know, and scientists are data-driven. So will it then be fair to you if the Nigerian government or other African countries on the red list were to restrict travel from the United Kingdom, seeing that the Omicron, I mean, the cases of the Omicron variant are in their hundreds now in the UK. So for, you know, reciprocity and diplomacy, will that be fair to you if those countries were to stop travel from the UK? I don't see this as an issue of reciprocity. I hope that Nigeria will continue, as it does now, to adopt a very evidence-based, uh, health priority-driven approach. You have one of the best you know, disease control centers, in, certainly in Africa, if indeed the world. You know, some of the most prominent medical epidemiologists are from Nigeria. So I'm absolutely confident that Nigeria will continue to adopt an evidence-based approach. Um, you know, when the, when the variant was first discovered, obviously I was here, Nigeria was very fast to, to tighten up its border control, quicker than the UK, frankly, and to introduce all the kind of um, the other measures. Um, and that's, I think, because you've got a lot of experience in dealing with um, Ebola, for example. So, and I reported all of that back to the UK. So I am confident and I hope that this won't be a sort of knee-jerk reciprocity. I hope that it will continue. The decision Nigeria makes, and it will be for Nigeria to make it that decision, will be based on the science. That's ironic because, I mean, people are calling the decision by the UK government knee-jerk. That's what they have called this. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you hope that the Nigerian government will not do the same. No, I'm saying that what I hope is that they will, do, they will adopt the same approach as us. They may not reach the same decision as us, but that, that it will be based on science. And I want to stress again, the analysis that's done, that is presented, is done by the scientists, by the health epidemiologists. It's, it's, it, there's a very clear kind of sort of Chinese war between the, the health assessment and then obviously ministers must ultimately take decisions because mm. ministers are accountable. But they've taken the advice that was given to them by the scientists. This is a variant of significant concern. It's very high risk. We don't understand it enough yet. We need to buy ourselves some time, protect the borders. Because at that stage, and I want to stress this, the community transmission had not set in. We are now at a different stage. And this will evolve and continue mm. to evolve, which is, of course, why it's kept under constant review. So let's talk about implementing this. I mean, it came into effect at 400 GMT on Monday. Mm -hmm. So we've had a few days uh, to implement this. And I'm talking about I mean, students' visas, for example, people who have made plans to see loved ones. It's the holidays, it's, yeah, exactly. it's Christmas, right? So mm -hmm. a lot of people have made plans uh, to see their loved ones. What happens to their applications in the light of this mm -hmm. new this new order? So the, the, what red listing means, just to make sure everyone understands, is that to enter the UK, you have to be a UK or an Irish citizen or a resident of the UK. Um, but So you can continue to travel to the UK if you meet those criteria, but unfortunately you have to secure a room in a mandatory hotel quarantine for 10 days and test at day two and test at day eight. So those are conditions. So anybody who meets those criteria can continue to travel. So students have residency rights in the UK. So student visas will continue to be processed completely as normal. I want to reassure people on that. We make a commitment to process in 15 days and we continue to meet that commitment. I do completely understand, though, it's going to be challenging for students because to their term starting early in January, they've got to ensure they've had enough time to get a visa processed if they don't already have one. And secondly, add in the 10 days of quarantine. So my really strong message to students is, you know, you, if you haven't already applied, you need to move very, very quickly so that you don't end up delaying your start of term. The second thing I would say is that many educational establishments following the previous um, earlier waves of COVID adopted flexible methodologies so that students, if they wanted to, if they didn't want to do the quarantine or felt they were gonna to be too delayed in starting term, can do an online uh, term and then rejoin. But that's institution by institution. Yeah. So check with your college. The third point is, and I recognize the cost issue, it is expensive, there's no doubt about that. But a lot of the, um, there's hardship um, of, uh, support available through a British government, but also your institution, your educational institution might be able to support you um, in the fees for, for quarantine, at least through a loan. So those, all this stuff is online and we can certainly make sure people have got all the links. Um, but I think just the key point for students is nothing changes. The visas are processed as normal. It's just that you need to add in the quarantine time. 
visit visas, sorry, just to add to the uh, people who are traveling for Christmas and so on, I'm afraid we, we do pause those. This is a, a rule for all red listed countries. Um, so essentially, you're, you're, where you are in the process is kind of frozen and then restarts when the red list um, ends. Um, but you won't lose anything. Um, you just you won't get a decision on your visit visa until the, the red list is lifted. Um, if you need your passport back, and of course some people will choose to travel elsewhere, that's absolutely no problem. You just need to contact the visa assessment centre and they will arrange a time for you to collect your, your passport. So does that mean those who have submitted their passports will get them back? Yes, they can. If they need their passport, no problem. They just contact the visa assessment centre where their passport is and arrange a time to collect it. I had somebody contact me this morning on that and very quickly we say, no problem, contact, and they've collected their passport. So that's no problem. Then what happens to the application? So the, the fees, if you've paid your fees, you don't have to pay again. So you, it's just, as I say, the, it's the decision that isn't taken at this point in time. Because obviously the reason is you, there's no point in issuing you a visa where the clock ticks for the, the number of months you're going to receive your visa because you can't travel um, to the UK at the moment. So the decision is taken once we know you can actually travel to the UK. And th there have been complaints uh, time and again. And mm. we, and we get quite a number of them, uh, people saying there's, there's a lot of delay in getting their, mm. you know, their application sorted, getting their visas, their passports. And uh, I wonder what has been done in, in, in that area. So you're talking about general delays in processing yes, visas? Yes, in processing. No, I, I hear that, and I receive a lot of uh, people contacting me on this, actually, this, this topic, and I can see how frustrating it is, to be honest. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of things to say on that. I mean, we've had a particular challenge recently because of the enormous number of visas we had to process for COP26. So that has unfortunately put a little bit of a backlog. And also COVID itself just, you know, constrained us um, in terms of the times the centres could be open, people contracting COVID. But I think you, um, you're aware there's, we've put a statement out and actually we're doing our absolute level best now to clear that backlog. There's going to be surge capacity brought in mm -hmm. to work as quickly as possible through the backlog. So I acknowledge the backlog, I acknowledge the frustration, but what I can reassure people of that we are now quite quickly moving through that backlog and I hope very soon we'll be able to get back to our commitment to process within the normal 15 days. You know, I, I imagine a lot of people listening to us now they're disappointed because they had plans, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, different plans. I mean, you've referenced yourself as well that you had plans and it um, looks like that's not happening. But I wonder, what would you say to these people who look forward to seeing family during Christmas? And, and this, was, this is a big deal for them. What would you say to them? I'm sorry. I feel for you. It's, it's, it's very disappointing. <clears throat> Nothing's more important than family and family reunions, particularly when you're living in different countries. I have my immediate family with me, my extended families in the UK. I'm disappointed. They're disappointed. So I, all I can say is I understand how you're feeling, uh, and I'm sorry, and I hope that as soon as we possibly can in the new year, you'll be able to reunite with your families. As soon as the, the assessments are done and there's reassurance that we can remove Nigeria from the red list, nobody will be happier than me, um, as long as we're confident that you know, it's based on, again, evidence and data. So I, I, I sympathise, essentially, and I hope you still can have a good Christmas, um, even if you're separated from family, and to encourage friends to rally round and support each other at this challenging time. Maybe there can be some sort of hope on the horizon, and, and I say this on the back of the fact that the UK government says this will be reviewed uh, by December the 20th, 20th yeah. but with the, the response you have gotten, the government has gotten at various levels from the UN, the WHO, from Nigerian government, from the governors, from the National Assembly, I mean, a nation of 200 million people. Mm. I mean, you've gotten that from other African countries as well. Is it likely uh, that the UK government will review this, I mean, before December the 20th? That's how many days away? About close to two weeks away. Well, the, the scientists are reviewing the data literally every day. So we're updating the, the number of cases, what we understand about the transmissibility, the efficacy of vaccines, and the impact. So that is under constant review. The former review point for all countries is on a three-week cycle. That's just the way the system works. So the scientists pull everything together and brief our ministers on a three-week cycle. In terms of hearing the reaction from Nigeria, I can absolutely assure you the reaction has been heard loud and clear. And as you said, it's come from all walks of life, including prominent Nigerians and international organizations. So that, that reaction has been heard. 
but I don't want to su suggest to anybody that that will change the basis of the decision because the health basis has to be the basis on which the decision has been made. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, you know, as this unfolds, I hope rapidly, um, I, I hope that there'll be uh, a point where um, before too long, where Nigeria certainly will be, will be able to remove Nigeria from the red list as soon as the health data convinces us that we can do that. You know, just yesterday, um, the National Association of Nigerian Students, they had a protest, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I know you're aware of that. Mm. And, you know, education is a major reason Nigerians actually have to travel to the UK. So they essentially represent a, you know, a major block mm. of travelers from Nigeria to the UK. And, and they protested, saying that when this uh, be rescinded, and they also protested about the exorbitant quarantine fees. And I wonder, I, I know the government is aware, you say, mm. what has been the reaction to that one? Well, first of all, we absolutely respect the right to protest and um, no problem at all with people coming to our High Commission as they did both in Abuja and here at the Deputy High Commission in Lagos. Um, and, you know, we've had protests, you know, during the three years I've been here on quite a number of issues. So absolutely encourage that, welcome that. People's voice should be heard. And indeed, we, we heard those voices. I hope what I've said today will reassure students that um, we're absolutely uh, committed to enabling them to continue their studies whilst recognising there are now additional hurdles that's going to be challenging for people. We want to help them navigate through this as smoothly as possible and we'll be, we're in very close touch with the educational institutions to try and encourage them to support those students through this difficult period. But the basic fact remains, as you said, it's a foundation of our partnership. There are, I think it's 13,000 Nigerian students in, studying in the UK. It's one of our highest student populations. So it matters enormously to us, hence why we continue to process the visas and to try and make that transition as smooth as possible. And the quarantine fees? <clears throat> well, on that, as I said, there is, there's two means. So there's a hardship support available through our um, health and social services. And I think there's a link on that people can find on .gov.uk but also the, um, the institutions themselves will often provide support to students who are struggling with, with paying those fees. So there are different methods to try and support students there. So, seeing all of the reaction, I mean, your position is not quite enviable. Like you've said it, Nigerians, they, they know what they want and they, they're quite loud about it. Uh, and I wonder what the UK government will be doing to amend uh, you know, the strained relationship because listening to the federal government, the National Assembly, the Nigerian Governors Forum, the Nigerian students, and hearing all of them saying, we do not want this. Uh, I wonder, what is the plan really to, to mend Well, I mean, the obviously, the, the decision on this is taken without too much notice. We, we, have, you know, we, we did obviously alert the government uh, as soon as we'd heard. I had personal phone calls with, with my key interlocutors. And, you know, I recognise this is a bumpy period, you know, and our relationship will go through some bumpy periods. Um, and I've been here three years, and I've been through a few. But I'm absolutely confident with the depth of our partnership and the commitment on both sides for our two governments to strengthen and deepen that relationship will get us through this. It is going to be challenging. I'm not under any illusions. And as I said, I'm hearing loud and clear the clear, consistent voices from everything from the National Assembly to students, um, the frustration, and I understand it. Um, so I hope people recognize that this is, as I said, not a decision we've taken lightly. We knew there would be implications of this. This decision has been taken for health reasons. Um, we'll get through it. The partnership is strong and solid, and we have so many people-to-people -people links. Um, we must get through it, because the UK-Nigeria partnership matters, matters the most. So is there, is there going to be a diplomatic solution, rather, uh, to this one? Uh, is that in the works? Have you been having... The diplomacy is there to ensure the communication channels work, um, both at official-to-official -official level, minister-to-minister -minister level, scientist-to-scientist, all of those three things are ongoing. Um, but at the end of the day, as I said, this isn't my decision. Um, this isn't even ultimate. If ministers make the decision, but the decision is based on the best scientists, and we've got some of the best in the UK working on this, um, and their advice to, to our ministers. 
One thing I do want to ensure that we strengthen going forward is that dialogue between our two health professionals through our health security agency and your NCDC. So, for example, we're already working together in genomic testing. I see Nigeria as playing a massively important role in a global network of, of, of health partnerships to help us prepare for the next pandemic. There will be more of these. We need to be ready and hopefully not have to go down red list travel bans and so on because we'll have a system globally that would enable us to prepare and react very quickly based on the best science. That's my aspiration and one of the lessons I think we can learn from, from this pandemic. Well, Hi Commissioner Katrina Ling. <laughs> It's been an honor speaking with you. We'll keep our, keep our fingers crossed and expect the very best. Thank you for having me on.